Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in this Natural Capital Conversation session today. We're really thrilled to welcome um, some wonderful speakers talking about um, some really crucial issues linking uh, the value of ecosystems to the human well being of society. So I'm just um, going to give you a few introductory slides. I'm Mary Ruckelshaus, the Managing Director of the Natural Capital Project, and really happy to have you here. So NatCap is a, uh, a wonderful partnership centered at Stanford University, and it's um, co a combination of research institutions, including the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Institute on the Environment at University of Minnesota and Stockholm Resilience Center, um, connected to the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. And what we do as a partnership and our extensive network is we really try to bring the latest, greatest science and technology to bring nature's values into decisions. So that those decisions of policy and finance really help people and nature thrive. And this conversation series that, we're, that you're joining today is one of our virtual programming offerings. And we've had a few um, already that have been really successful. So it's a mix of new science and also practitioners all talking about this community that we're building um, around putting nature's values more front and center in decisions. And you can find more information about other sessions other um, in this series on our website. So a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel and the, and the slides that are presented today will also be shared with you in an email after today's webinar. And then just a little bit of housekeeping. So if you have questions for the speakers, please put those in the Q&A box on your screen. And if you're having technical difficulties or other sort of logistical issues, you can put those in the chat box and we'll help you as soon as we can. So our schedule for the, the talks today is um, just this brief intro, and I'll introduce our host in just a minute. And then we have two talks, one by Dr. Elisa Oteros Rosas, and then one by Dr. Nora Fegerholm. And then we'll have a panel discussion with Q&A. We really, really do welcome your questions and good engagement because there's really um, ample time for that. We've saved that today. And then we'll wrap up around 11 o'clock. So, for now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to all of you uh, Dr. Alejandra Echeverri, or Ale. She's a postdoc with NatCap, and she's working on ways to better integrate biodiversity and ecosystem services into development plans um, at the national scale in Colombia and Costa Rica. And Ale brings rigor from ecology and a deep appreciation for social sciences to better understand this connection between nature and people. And she's put together two wonderful panels on cultural ecosystem services. The first one was on February 6th, so you can find that recording on our website. And today the theme is crucial to really transforming ecosystems and societies by quantifying nature's values through deep engagement with the people who both affect and are affected by the state of nature. So over to you, Ale. Thank you, Mary, for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to now share my screen. So first, I want to um, recognize that I'm calling from the ancestral lands of the Muwekma of Ohlone tribe, where our academic institution sits. We offer our grateful appreciation for the opportunity to live and work here as we celebrate the culture and perseverance of the Muwekma Oholoni people and their strong identity. So this topic of cultural ecosystem services or the cultural benefits um, is really key to understanding um, people's connections with nature. 
They are the defined in by Kai Chan and colleagues as ecosystems contributions to the non-material benefits like capabilities and experiences that arise from human ecosystem relationships. Many of you in the audience are probably familiar with the topic of ecosystem services and you probably know that these benefits uh, that people get from nature, such as provisioning services like wood or pollination. Um, there are also regulating services like carbon storage or water purification and supporting services like biodiversity and soil formation. These have mostly been studied in the literature. But then in studies of ecosystem services, I, I would say that the cultural services such as the aesthetic values that we get from ecosystems, artistic inspiration, education, recreation, are comparatively less studied, but are very important because these are probably one of the reasons why we all care about the environment. So I want to acknowledge that in the US, uh, it's Black History Month, and I wanted to recognize the work done by many scholars, leaders, practitioners, that self-identify as Black. And I wanted to introduce today's topic uh, with a quote from Dr. Wangari Matai, who is the Nobel Peace Prize Albert D and the leader of the Greenbelt Movement. Um, Dr. Wangari Matai said, in a few decades, the relationship between the environment, resources and conflict may seem as obvious as the connection we see today between human rights, peace and democracy. And I want to make sure that we consider that these topics have been um, pretty crucial to in the environmental movement. So today we have two talks by two great speakers. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Elisa Oteros Rosas. Elisa is an ecologist and biologist by training, but an interdisciplinary researcher and activist by design. She's the chair of agroecology and food systems of the University of Vic and the Universitat Central de Catalunya. Uh, her research activity is also intertwined with an active participation in organized civil society spaces such as Ecologistas en Acción and the Spanish platform for pastoralism and extensive livestock and ganaderas en red. Elisa's talk uh, titled Culture to the Power of Three, Landscapes, Ecosystem Services and Valuation, will present uh, a lot of her work that has been done in agroecological landscapes um, in Europe and across the world with many colleagues. We also have the pleasure um, to, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Nora Fegelholm. She's an adjunct professor in the Department of Geography and Geology in the University of Turku, Finland. Trained as a human geographer, she's also a landscape researcher whose research has for the most part focused on participatory spatial planning and applying GIS for participation in place-based assessments of local experiential knowledge and ecosystem services and landscapes. Nora's talk titled Insights to Participatory Mapping of Ecosystem Services will draw on examples from all over the world, including uh, Spain and Tanzania. So it's um, my pleasure to give it over to Alisa and we'll come back after the two talks for a Q&A discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ale, Lori. Mm everyone that has been behind the organization of this uh, webinar. It's such a pleasure to have been invited here. And um, as, uh, as Ale was already introducing, I'm passionate about cultural ecosystem services uh, because uh, mostly I can say that it was all initiated when I started my PhD with Transhuman Shepherds. So, and I received the invitation. I, I thought to then invite you for a for a walk on some of my research on cultural landscapes, cultural ecosystem services, and social cultural evaluation of ecosystem services. So this is why I uh, titled this this chat today Cube uh, Three, no Q, a Culture Cube, um, and uh, and let me share my screen. 
and uh, we'll see some some of the research no that they have been doing in collaboration with many people who will I will also acknowledge uh, along the the coming minutes. So basically, I have worked in culture and landscape, mostly in, in agroecosystems and in Europe, even though I also worked a little bit in, in Latin America and Colombia. But uh, as I said, on cultural ecosystem services, and I have a particular interest on local traditional ecological knowledge. I haven't worked much with indigenous peoples, but I have always uh, been attracted by these different forms of, of wisdom and, and different uh, knowledge systems and how are they intertwined and, and should dialogue. And uh, <clears throat> as, as I stepped into the ecosystem services uh, world, I, I realized, I will explain now how and when uh, that I was particularly attracted by this sociocultural perspective. I always say that I'm a biologist or ecologist uh, from training, but I have always been a high humanist, I think, no? since, since my early ages. So um, I was particularly interested by human nature relationships and, and, and perception of, of uh, ecosystems and their, their functioning. Um, so, uh, I want to, uh, I, I could say that one of the first things that, that uh, I started with was this uh, exploration of what is the knowledge landscape of ecosystem services assessment in the Mediterranean ecosystem. No? And, uh, and I stepped into this thanks to, to Berta Martin Lopez, who I want to acknowledge and send a big hack uh, today from here. I know many of you know her. So uh, Berta is probably the my largest reason to be to be in this uh field today and um and thanks to marta uh, nieto romero we did we managed to do this uh this uh, literature review on, on ecosystem services assessment all along mediterranean uh, basin and we found out exactly that indeed sociocultural valuations and cultural ecosystem services were the ones that were least evaluated no least frequently so uh, uh, then we also realized that uh, these type of ecosystem services were particularly relevant for in, in, in extensive agroecosystems, which play a particular, a very important role in, in the Mediterranean basin and are uh, largely responsible for the Mediterranean basin actually uh, to be a biodiversity hotspot. So uh, it was like a big gap no, that we that we acknowledge there. And that is this is why I, I then focus my, my PhD on sociocultural evaluation of, of ecosystem services, even though always in collaboration, no, in an interdisciplinary team and always with a step still in, in deep ecology, one could say, and, and also with some uh, monetary evaluation from a from a critical perspective. Um, from there, I, I also have had the chance to work at a European scale with Nora, actually, and, and colleagues from, from, at the moment, the University of Copenhagen. Now we are all a bit more spread in the Hercules project, uh, where we did um, a content analysis of social media photos to explore the relation between cultural ecosystem services and landscape features. We thought that analyzing the people, the people pictures, that the, what people portray in pictures and then upload to, to internet, we use to, to platforms, uh, Flickr and Panoramio, is a proxy for what people appreciate, what, what they value and perceive of, of ecosystems. No? We did this in five uh, study cases in, in Europe. And what we found was that actually there was a difference. No? We found four groups of, of uh, uh, associations between um, landscape features and uh, ecosystem services. No, so uh, sorry. Oops, this is okay. Uh, so, for instance, one group was more associated with with uh, water ecosystems like rivers, ponds, seas, or, or coastal and aquatic recreation. Someone more associated with mountain and, and snow and ice uh, landscapes with people hiking and, and having uh, features associated to terrestrial recreation. Another one was more related with grasslands and wood pastures, uh, shrubs, trees, and, and also certain types of in infrastructures. Also related to traditional farming practices like stone walls, for instance, uh, or shepherds' um, homes. And these were associated with cultural heritage. And another group um, was associated with, with more with lone and urban areas and trees, and this was linked with social, spiritual, uh, and cultural heritage uh, values. 
Uh, then from there, uh, zooming in into another scale uh, of, of a spatial scale, which is in Spain, together again led by, by Berta and many of our colleagues from the Social Ecological Systems Laboratory in Madrid, and not also, also, also from the past country, we pulled together a sample of more than 3,000 uh, um, surveys in Spain on ecosystem services with some uh, close end questions, which are the ones that we analyzed in this paper. Um, and some open-ended uh, questions. And what we found was that uh, social perceptions tend to bundle in ecosystem services uh, according to human nature uh, relationships. And, and we found indeed an association of uh, a certain cultural uh, values. No? In particular, uh, services demanded by urban people tend to be uh, more associated to environmental education, aesthetics, nature tourism. So these type of ecosystem services were more perceived by urban people. And still others perceived more by rural people were linked to multifunctional landscapes and particularly those protected by natural parks. And when we went into analyzing the open-ended questions of those uh, th that similar sampling uh, effort, uh, we found with, and, and this uh, paper was led by my colleague Marina Garcia Llorente, also in Spain in the same study areas, what we found was that uh, surprisingly, even though we, as we had seen uh, the, the usually less valued in the, in the scientific literature, usually the less valued um, ecosystem services are cultural instead, these are the uh, ones that people value more, that they perceive more, no? in particular uh, uh, in, in urban areas like Bilbao Metropolitan Greenbelt and, and the urban home gardens. So they have an important and relevance for the people. No? They, are, they are frequently perceived by people, particularly in urban areas. And again, as we have seen in the close end, what we found was that uh, people perceive tend to perceive a, a more diverse pool of ecosystem services in multifunctional landscapes, like in Sierra Nevada, Mediterranean mountains, and the case study where I did my PhD, the one that I contributed here, which is the one of the Conquense Drove Road. It's a pastoralist uh, social ecological system, a social ecological network I will, I will speak about in a minute. So uh, I, uh, we found a, a similar trend, but the, the novelty or the, the originality that we found here was uh, this relation with multifunctionality. And then zooming in again uh, to the case study in which I did my, my PhD, um, uh, then uh, we, we, we worked with, with this very, very particular practice and social ecological system, which is uh, the one associated to transhumans. Transhumancy is a pastoralist practice, which is that is spread worldwide, and um, it consists on a migration of herds with livestock, uh, cattle, sheep, goats, and also other animals, from uh, summering areas, which are usually highest in altitude and latitude, to southern areas and the other way uh, around in order to follow the uh, primary productivity peaks. It's an adaptation, an imitation, basically, of, of what natural uh, wild uh, herbivores usually do, no? following this, this primary productivity peak. And in Spain, it is a lifestyle. So there is still a number of, of herds that do this migration yearly. Obviously, nowadays, unfortunately, most of them do it on track, but still it, it contributes to a certain um, sustainability of both summer and winter in areas and, and grassland management. And, and there is still a number of people that do it on foot. So in the Conquense the Drove Road in particular is the longest that is still done on foot. It has more than 500 kilometers and, and there are more than around 20, 25 hertz that do it every, every year, no? this migration. Um, what we did was assessing the perception of the different ecosystem services along the year, the different uh, uh, seasons and, and, and also in spatial term along the, the network. And what we found was that uh, the cultural ecosystem services were the ones that were more largely perceived as important for personal well-being, as a, in, as a difference or in opposition with other type of ecosystem services that uh, were also valued for the social well-being, no? like other oriented values. And also that the cultural ecosystem services were almost the only ones that tend to have in some cases uh, some increasing or improving trends, particularly those related uh, with, with economic benefits also, like rural tourism and nature recreation activities, uh, and also environmental education. 
Uh, and we also found that the two ecosystem services that uh, were perceived, that there were two of these cultural ecosystem services that were perceived particularly vulnerable if the transhumans would disappear, which are the way of cultural exchange that this, you know, this role that, that the road road and transhuman plays and local ecological knowledge. Uh, so this is what motivated or my next step to, to, to enter and, and work and study better uh, what eco local ecological knowledge is, is there in this system and, and what is happening with it, uh, with it also in relation to the, to the activity. Uh, and I will uh, step out of transhumans for a moment, even though I will go back in a while um, to also share this other uh, word, which is anyway related to some of the some in area, sorry, winter in areas of for certain uh, transhuman uh, pastoralists in Spain, in Extremadura. Um, and it's a work that I did in Copenhagen, the, the, led by, by Mario Torralba with the NAC Forward uh, group, in which we studied how uh, um, different states, different DSAs, the silvo pastoral systems under different man management uh, regimes and access regimes were providing uh, different pools of, of, of ecosystem services. And what we found was that there were trade-offs even within uh, between uh, cultural services. No? For instance, in the largest and more heterogeneous states that were not accessible, uh, there were better housing facilities and, and more hunting, uh, but uh, at the expenses of certain uh, ecosystem services like recreation no? and, and, and harvesting of wild species. And, and this was not the case, for instance, in more medium-sized and easily accessible states like the commons, for instance, no? like the commonals. Um, and we also found that there were some bundles between the ecosystem services, no? that there were some that tended to, that tended to, to to concentrate, to be uh, perceived uh, in, uh, by uh, all together. No? Um, following, uh, coming back to transhumans, another interesting methodology relatively, well, not similar, but uh, associated to that of, of uh, using visual stimuli, no? uh, related to the previous one in which we analyzed the content of the images. In this way, we directly stimulated people, we provided them pictures, to and ask them to compare uh, which one they preferred and uh, which ecosystem services they perceived uh, were provided by the landscape for trade in these in these photos, and one of them had a road road. This one, if uh, some people can perceive it, some not. Of course, it depends on how used you are to the landscape, and some didn't have it. And here the same. No, this is a road road. In this is the the um, the Samarin area, and this is the the drove. Uh, the, the intermediate area. And um, what we found was well that the perception was uh, di different in the different areas, but uh, um, that uh, um, the profiles of people preferring the landscape with road roads tended to be those more rural with people that had better knowledge of the of the area. No? So that many people, particularly those, particularly those with uh, more um, uh, urban profiles, better uh, education, um, and, and less um, and younger tended to prefer uh, pictures with without the the road road. No, so like it seems to that there is a decoupling of of um, uh, of uh, of, the, of the perception of the environment. Uh, and then on traditional ecological knowledge, as I said, I, I, I was fascinated by this topic and, and digged into it um, also to understand why um, different profiles of people had uh, these different relationships to nature and how are they evolving. And um, what we what we found was that, uh, as in many other cases had uh, reported previously in the literature, was that this is being lost in a way. But surprisingly, and, and, and this is contrasting with other studies, the, but the variables that influence most in, in this case, in the case of transhumans, their, um, their maintenance of traditional ecological knowledge was not only age and gender and, and whether livestock raising was the main occupation, but also if they were currently transhumans on food. So also the use actually that they did of this knowledge was a, is a proxy that explained very much their uh, their um, their knowledge nowadays. 
And uh, uh, in order to better integrate these different sources of knowledge into the maintenance of, of transhumans, I was also interested then in two participatory approaches. And I had never been much satisfied about this, just more uh, light participation approaches, more uh, related with consultation. So together with Grace Villamor and Ignacio Palomo and other colleagues, we built up this conceptual framework to analyze and reflect on, on the different degrees of participation we can have to integrate, uh, to understand the different sources of ecological knowledge and uh, uh, the, the also the different uh, values that ecosystem services provide, no? Um, and we analyzed, uh, then we, we applied and, and reflected uh, in, a two, in two ways, no? In a back and forth uh, dynamic uh, based on, on our case studies. Uh, and, and in particular, I, uh, I reflected on participatory scenario planning, which is one of my passions that I am happy to share also with some of the natural capital uh, colleagues. And, and in participatory scenario planning also, we have been trying to incorporate ecosystem services assessment in a more deliberative way, so that people uh, can, uh, once they step into the future thinking and the different scenarios, they can also um, assess, reflect collectively on the normativity of the scenarios based on the, the flows of ecosystem services that these different scenarios, uh, that the landscapes in these different scenarios would be eventually providing. And then that contributes, no, that helps also to, to advance uh, uh, backcasting phases or more strategic proposals uh, for action for transformation. Uh, so this is uh, so far some pieces of my, my path from the European scale to the tiny scale of our uh, transhuman uh, landscapes in Spain. And I'll be happy to answer any questions about how we adopted these methodologies or suggestions, comments, whatever. Thank you. And uh, I'm giving now the floor to my colleague, Nora. And um, yeah, hope yeah. to engage later. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks for a nice presentation. And, and I also thank a lot uh, for the invitation to join this event as a speaker. So I'm Nora Feirholm and I'm a, a, I have a PhD in geography and, and um, I hold the title of docent in participatory landscape research and currently I'm academy research fellow funded by the Academy of Finland and PI of a five-year uh, project called Green Place. And my research interest linked to a, a holistic understanding of human environment interactions in geospatial context and I have worked since 2005 uh, with uh, uh, place-based approaches to local experiential knowledge on ecosystem services and landscapes. And today I will highlight such uh, participatory mapping approaches. So let's see if I manage to share my screen. Yes, uh, and for the structure of my presentation, so I will first uh, uh, talk a bit about participatory mapping, what it is, uh, and um, what is important to consider in participatory mapping of ecosystem services. And then I show some uh, case studies, both from Africa and Europe. So what is uh, participatory mapping? It refers to multiple ways we humans interact to create and communicate knowledge and experience and aspirations about the world in maps. Uh, it often means the creation of maps by local communities, uh, but it also involves uh, uh, other organizations such as governments and non-governmental organizations, universities, and also often some other actors. Uh, that are engaged in this develop in the development and, and land related planning and participatory maps whether they are crude or sophisticated are created for a wide range of of human environment applications uh, which could be for example delineation of territorial boundaries uh, land cover land use boundaries for example identifying important places that sustain local livelihoods and quality of life, life and, and communicating preferences about future land uses. 
uh, participatory mapping uh, can be said to be a kind of an umbrella term uh, covering public participation GIS, so PPGIS, participatory GIS, PGIS, and, and volunteered geographic information, BGI. And there are also maybe some others that uh, you have come across in the literature, but these are maybe the three most common ones. Um, so we uh, humans uh, constantly modify our land and living space, and this leads not only to uh, multiple land uses, but also to a diversity of perceptions and meanings and values attached to specific places. And uh, to include people's experiences uh, to planning and management of land and resources, uh, these especially explicit landscape assessment methods have uh, been developed for stakeholder involvement. And, and uh, here, these participatory mapping approaches have raised interest among uh, the ecosystem service community as well, uh, as an approach to social cultural assessment of ecosystem services. There are many different ways uh, to collect data with participatory mapping approaches. It can be done, for example, using printed maps uh, or satellite images uh, or web based platforms, and uh, it can also be done in groups or individually. And these different approaches. Uh, connect to different knowledge systems and ways of identifying value. Uh, so firstly, we could say that there is kind of this instrumental para paradigm uh, that uh, stresses individuals and their values uh, and the collective understanding of that then emerges from their aggregation. And then there is this uh, deliberative paradigm, uh, which then again places emphasis on communication and argumentation. Uh, to understand values among a group of, of people, participants. And in my work, I have mainly applied the instrumental approach, uh, which communicates the assigned values. And this means the judgment uh, regarding the appreciation of various places and ecosystems and species and so on in the everyday landscapes. And these ecosystem service benefits are provided by the perceptions that uh, emerge from the interaction with the landscape and from the relationships uh, among the people and between the people and the landscape. And uh, so now I move to give examples of such uh, studies uh, from Africa and Europe. So uh, in Eastern Africa, in Tanzania, uh, within the Tanzania team of uh, University of Turku, led by Professor Nina Kauke, uh, we have developed methods for participatory mapping in the context where uh, there is a need to understand these intellect socio-ecological processes that cause landscape change and, and create pressure on forest resources at local levels. And um, using wooden beads uh, and printed satellite images, the local residents, we have asked them to map relevant sites of important activities and values in their everyday landscape, and this has allowed then the identification of these uh, collective spatial patterns in the landscape. And how has this been uh, linked to ecosystem services? So in this case, uh, I created a typology that particularly addresses both the subjective perceptions and uses of the landscape, which actually crosses over several ecosystem service categories. And uh, firstly, we have uh, here identified the landscape or ecosystem services. Well, in this case, we use the uh, landscape services as a sort of a um, specification to ecosystem services, but maybe I don't have time to go into details about why we did this. Uh, we can, um, but anyway, so we identified this landscape or ecosystem services and their indicators on the landscape and then the actual uh, questions that were used in the mapping process. And the informants were then indicating places of direct use of natural resources, for example, uh, sites for subsistence farming and non-material intangible value-based knowledge relating, for example, to aesthetic or religious values. So then we analyzed uh, the data together with land cover and land use change data derived from 1930s until today from 
old maps and aerial images and satellite images. And uh, here on the left uh, side, we see land cover class and amount of uh, change trajectory in this specific village of Jeju. And on the right uh, side, uh, we see the special data that describes the landscape service intensity and richness that came out from the participatory mapping service. And bring these data sets together uh, enriches uh, the in interpretation of the uh, landscape dy dynamics um, in this uh, village. And, uh, and this has potential to enhance spatial argumentation about the complex socio-ecological interactions in this landscape. So for example, we can see that agroforestry practices are able to sustain the forest cover in the vicinity of villages. Um, so here, if we look at these patterns, so these identify uh, that kind of a resource zone that extends one kilometer outwards from the villages and, and it is extremely valuable and important for the livelihoods of the local people. Um, then as a next step, we, or maybe particularly our PhD student uh, Salla Eilola, uh, was leading uh, this process uh, as part of her PhD, so we co-developed participatory mapping methodology for village land use planning processes in Tanzania and, and assessed uh, the user benefits of it. And these included increased uh, special data quality, uh, leading to more reliable uh, land use plans, participation of different community members, uh, use of uh, satellite image as a visual and special aid, to express opinions. Um, so it was kind of uh, useful. And um, in collaboration with the National Land Use Planning Commission of Tanzania, our team produced a guideline. Uh, and this guideline includes step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how to use the methodology uh, in, in real life. Um, this was a kind of a nice uh, and un, sort of also unplanned outcome from our research activities in Tanzania. Uh, I included here a link uh, to a short video. If you're interested, you can have a look uh, when you get the slides after the seminar. Then uh, now I jump to another study in Europe. Uh, this was developed at the University of Copenhagen related to some uh, EU-funded project called Act Forward that Ellis also mentioned, and, and she's also uh, in the photo uh, on the slide here. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, we developed um, an online map-based survey to assess uh, uh, ecosystem services across uh, 13 study sites in Europe. And the aim here was to understand which ecosystem services are perceived in different landscapes by different people and how uh, landscapes contribute to people's well-being. So we look both at the respondent and landscape characteristics uh, as determinants of place-based ecosystem services. So we had a facilitated semi-structured map-based survey uh, where 10 different ecosystem service benefits were mapped. Uh, they ranged from, uh, as you can see there in, in the image, from farm products to harvested products to outdoor activities, social interaction aesthetics, and so on, uh, existence values, habitat and biodiversity, and, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, here we see an example of the data in one of the study sites in Spain, where 181 respondents mapped uh, more than 2,400 uh, sites for ecosystem service benefits. And uh, across all sites overall, the key ecosystem services were outdoor recreation, aesthetic values, and sites for social interactions. And what was interesting was that the provisioning services, so here the farm products and harvested products, they were emphasized in regions with low GDP and population density and high proportion of inhabitants that work in agriculture. So this was mainly the case uh, related to Mediterranean and Eastern European study sites that we had. And then again, the cultural services uh, were more appreciated in, in those regions where the GDP is high and 
and also the population density is high. So central and northern European study sites in among these 13 sites that we had here. So in this uh, case of the European cross-site comparison, we applied a common approach in participatory mapping studies where we mapped uh, ecosystem service benefits uh, that stressed the uh, respondents' subjective values and activities in their everyday landscapes. And these are often then linked to cultural ecosystem service category. So um, these anthropocentric values uh, can be both uh, in instrumental, so for example, the farm and harvested products, but they can also be relational. Uh, meaning, for example, the social interaction and inspiration that we had on the list among the 10 mapped benefits. But they can also be, uh, they cannot always be placed to one category only. An example of, of such is harvesting, which can be practiced both uh, for subsistence, uh, but also for recreation and inspiration uh, can be related to it. Okay. Uh, to highlight something more from the results, so we modeled land cover and conservation area characteristics and accessibility as determinants of mapped uh, ecosystem service benefits. And, and we discovered that uh, accessibility is the most significant predictor uh, of appreciation of ecosystem services. And then that the mapped ecosystem service sum and also their diversity increases with land cover richness. So. This means that mosaic landscapes are favored by people and highlights the importance of multifunctionality and special patterns uh, for generating these social cultural values. And, and of course, then the results have implications for management of multifunctional landscapes in, in Europe and, and also elsewhere uh, in similar contexts. Um, okay, so then finally, uh, here on my last uh, slide, I have an example of, uh, of an ongoing research from my current uh, Green Place project. Um, so in the city of Turku, we asked uh, residents to map COVID-19 related changes in green space use and evaluate how nature contributes to their well-being. Um, and uh, respondents were also asked to about various uh, cultural ecosystem service benefits linked to the outdoor recreation sites that they mapped in the survey. And here in, in the map, uh, what we see is uh, uh, statistically significant clusters, so hot and cold spots of cultural ecosystem service benefits at the outdoor recreation sites. And when we look at the blue and, and red uh, uh, clusters uh, there, it shows that the hotspots are located outside the urban core uh, and in, in the very green areas close to water. Um, so this is a work that we are working progress and, and we, we are currently analyzing the data further. Um, okay, I, these were all my slides. Uh, I would like to encourage those who are interested in participatory mapping to uh, visit uh, the Participatory Mapping Institute website, which is a recently established uh, network of academics working with these methods. So you're very, very welcome to join. And, um, and then there's my email uh, so if you have any questions. and. Um, um, uh, later on, and then links to our Tanzania team website, to Geospatial Labs and, and my uh, ongoing Green Place project. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Elisa and Nora. Um, I'm going to ask Elisa to, yeah, there you go, to turn on her video. And I'm going to kick off this uh, panel discussion. We are finally getting some questions in the chat too. So thank you to everyone who has submitted your questions and I encourage you to keep adding them because I will be reading through them. Um, to kick off this discussion, uh, we have a question by Luisa Arbosa. Thank you, Luisa, nice to see you uh, in this virtual room. She's a colleague from Colombia who lives in, in Spain. So it's very interested in these topics. And this is a question for Elisa. 
Luisa says, I imagine you're familiar with the resistance that many natural science researchers have towards participatory processes that involve civil society. Much of it arises from researchers feeling that what they do is too complex to be debated with non-specialists. So in your experience, what have your research gained from involving local communities? Can you please provide one or two concrete examples? Yeah, thank you. This indeed is super frequent. <laughs> I even still had an issue around this in a in a position committee recently, and, and this was the hottest conversation. So yeah, in my experience, I would say thinking of precise examples as as you also request, no. Working with participatory approaches contributes to generate a space of, of dialogue between different stakeholders that usually don't sit together and that then they are kind of forced, so to say, to set up a common language to listen, which is something that unfortunately that nowadays we are not used to do, which is more used to say in our our uh, um, say, no, our voice, our ideas, and, and not so much to listen. Um, and then uh, if we have sufficient time, and this is, the, I would say, the, the core challenge of participatory processes to have enough resources and time to devote with communities. Then what we have seen, at least with transhumans, for instance, in Spain, is that uh, this kind of participation also foster deeper alliances. No, So now my colleagues in Madrid have a life project, a huge life project, to um, work on the restoration and on the linkages between the practices the, of transhumans, the drug roads, and biodiversity enhancement and recovery. So, and that's thanks to col the collaboration. And um, another, another um, a, a very, very clear example I have seen, and it's something we are also experiences, uh, experiencing with, with colleagues um, and, and, and their feminist perspectives and epistemologies of, of science, is that participatory processes allow to incorporate the emotional components. And most frequently, the challenge, the current environmental challenges, social environmental challenges that we are facing are very much related with, with emotional uh, um, aspects and reactions and attitudes. And participatory processes allow to work with that beyond numbers, beyond rationality, beyond scientific um, data. Um, or, or with it also, no? And, and finally, also, uh, um, I would say the last thing is that it, it allows also to, to set a space for cross-pollination between initiatives, no? Something I really like when I do this participatory scenario planning is to kind of bring people disturbing also, no? From, from other areas that no one, or from the agroecology movement or from another pastoralist setting or from a different research perspective, and those are kind of, no, it allows you to kind of pull in perturbances with different views, different uh, experiences, and that can then perhaps be incorporated in the, in, in the setting, uh, in the context, and uh, no, sometimes catalyze uh, changes. Those would be some examples. Thank you, Elisa. And now we have a question from Natalia Dom Domnina uh, to Nora. What data do you think is best received from the local community in pencil, so to say, and what data contributes more for this soft technology? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, for people, it's always easiest to map things that are close to their um, personal life or everyday practices and, and uh, so these kind of issues are much easier, for example, to map compared to development preferences, like future preferences of an area or so on. Uh, but um, relating to the technology of mapping, uh, um, I would say that very big different, difference also comes uh, from the fact that if a survey is facilitated, like we did in our European cross-site, uh, 
uh, service, it, the approach was that was that we had online service, but we had in each local site trained facilitators who approached the people and they sort of did the survey together. So in, this increased a lot the data quality uh, in this case. So I have also experiences from online service which are done uh, like self-administered and and there we certainly see uh, that the um, uh, the samples often are quite biased, and this might also be partly due to the technological, uh, uh, yeah, different technological skills that that people have. Thank you. And now we have a question from Lorena Muñoz to both participants. So thanks for the great presentations. Um, on participatory mapping, how was the participation rate in these studies? How did you recruit participants? Did you have to include incentives uh, to increase participation? I, I, I can start. <laughs> in these Tanzanian cases, we have always worked in intense collaboration with the uh, local uh, village leaders and uh, um, and we have aimed to recruit people so that we have a balanced representation of uh, different uh, age groups and genders in the village. So we have been following um, who we uh, interview or survey, and then we can also capture those that are missing from the sample. And uh, we have given a compensation in the case of Tanzania, I think, uh, it is a good thing to do when we consider that uh, people might stay in the village and don't go to their fields and, and sort of lose part of their daily income. Uh, so we have chosen that. On online map service uh, for the Turku case, uh, for the COVID uh, survey that I showed, we just did convenience sampling, so the link was distributed in all sorts of media, through all sorts of media, media channels, and, and of course this led to a biased sample, so we have over-representation of women, highly educated uh, and middle-aged. Um, but I have also actually looked at the lit published uh, literature lately dealing with green areas uh, that women actually quite often are overrepresented in these studies. So maybe there is also a connection that women tend to respond to such surveys. Yeah, I would only add that it really depends in my experience so much on the cultural setting. So basically it's critical for you to know the place. No, I remember with Nora when we were designing the also a survey in Extremadura and it was good fun not to exchange how, how would each of us designed that uh, because Nora had not been to like working in Spain beforehand. So it made us also think, no? And, um, and this is also related with, I think some next question about the online tools, no? Um, actually in Spain, um, most of field work in these uh, topics is um, needs to be done by spending a lot of time in the area. So you have to, to be living there with people. Uh, this might sound super strange, but I would say more than 50% of my research uh, in rural areas has been done in bars um, with a beer <laughs> or in discussions because in Spain, life takes place and, and, and social discussions and it takes place in bars. And I'm totally aware that this would never work in Finland or in Sweden, I don't know, in Tanzania, uh, but this is how, how it works in, in Spain. Um, so yeah, it depends a lot. And for instance, what we are seeing uh, in the last year is that online tools, at least like interviews, surveys, like individually based uh, tools do not work in Spain. We, we already tested this with Nora with participatory mapping in the Sierra Guadarrama National Park and we struggled and it didn't work. Uh, if they're not facilitated face-to-face, -face, um, it doesn't really work. Uh, but uh, we had this year in October, the first online participatory scenario planning. Uh, and we were also super skeptical whether people would join for two days 
in Zoom, uh, and there were different profiles, some people were familiar, some people were not. We managed, and it went super well. We had more than 40 people for two days, but we made a huge effort of design we had a huge team of a very experienced facilitators like a professional we know we hire professional facilitators uh and we devoted i know like three times uh the time that we should would have devoted to design uh face-to-face uh, um, -face version so we use several of these online tools now that are nowadays popping up like the spatial chat and Miro and several of these of these tools actually helped. But I think also because we had a professional advice on how to do that. Thank you. I see that now the chat has so many questions and we only have a few minutes left in the discussion, but we will um, keep track of these questions and I'll make sure to email them to the panelists so that they can answer you by email if we don't do it live. So we have probably time for this last question by Nicole Buckley Biggs, and it's how has participatory mapping research influenced local land use planning or conservation decision making? So beyond the research, um, has it influenced decision making? For both of you. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, always the, the thing I wish uh, would happen. Uh, but we as researchers, we, we know that it's very difficult to m make uh, a change in the real life and, and a change in decision making. Uh, but still, however, I'm, I'm very happy and about the, the fact that we managed to change the village land use planning process in Tanzania through the guideline that was developed based on those uh, ideas and methods that we developed uh, through our research. So I see that there is a real change that has happened. Uh, when it comes to participatory mapping approaches, uh, Finland, uh, there has been a lot of sort of university spin off, uh, um, a, a, a specific company even that has been developing and uh, spreading these approaches on, to municipalities across the country and there has been this healthy sort of competitive situation and i can say that uh, in finland currently uh, many many municipalities are actually using these approaches in their land use planning uh, processes so they are institutionalized and i think that is a great great thing that has happened throughout the past years but as a researcher who has been working with these methods for for a long time what i see as a as a varying fact is that in order to do a, a, a collect data do a survey that includes a mapping component with the people uh, it needs to be well planned you need to know what you're asking and what the type of data is coming out and it it's not always very easy and simple to do and unfortunately of course at the municipality level for example in finland these who are administering uh, participatory mapping service uh, in the land use planning processes, they don't necessarily have the skills and capacities to plan good service. So I have also the bit of the worry that it might sometimes lead to, to com complicated questions and, and service and so on. And then what I would really like to stress also is that when we're talking about land use planning processes and participation, it's the mapping approaches not, are not the only way of participation that should be included, but there are also many other ways of participation and these should be all used sort of in tandem. Elisa, do you have anything to add? Mm. I think it's a, it's a critical question indeed. Um, I would say, in my experience, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in Spain, I would say institutions are still not so open to uh, research inputs or research processes as it might be in, in Scandinavia, no? as, as Nora was saying. Um, but in my experience, uh, participatory approaches are slowly um, uh, kind of entering a different um, 
dimension in the way in the sense that it is participatory is participation is something that is compulsory usually for instance in in, in protected areas or for administra public administration and it has been taken and it's still largely taken in many places like a, a standard procedure no that is done because it's compulsory but increasingly i think civil society is um, reclaiming that it's it's meaningfulness no uh, and it's by doing it, it's also a way of transforming people's willingness and people's um, uh, understanding of how it's done. So it's a practice. And I think the culture of participation is increasing. Uh, I would say uh, this is happening in, in many different parts, but again, it's something that is very deep, no, very deep context dependent on, on cultural issues and, and, on, uh, and also on, on the socioeconomic uh, situation. No? So one of the um, one of the things I learned while working in, in Colombia in a very critical moment where the, where the armed conflict was still very active was that participation has always cost, uh, also for participants, of course, no? we are demanding them for time, for this knowledge, and that, that's uh, a cost. Um, but for some people, participation might mean risking their lives or their jobs, or, uh, or so the, the cost might be large. So I also tend to be cautious no? when, when speaking and thinking about participation, uh, because it's not always easy, it's not always desirable. Uh, one needs to be very, very conscious also to manage expectations. So no, we are researchers and we can contribute and try to foster transformation, but transformation most frequently is not directly on our hands, uh, even though we can do things for it. But so, I think they're normative, no? This kind of a political dimension of what is participation, how is it done, and, and why, and, and who is there and who is not, and and um, and this is, uh, and, I don't know, I think relevant debate, no? That it's important to have between researchers and with with the rest of the society. Thank you. So we are already at time, but I'm gonna use the next two minutes to wrap up and. Um, introduce actually that there will be an upcoming conversation. So as Mary mentioned uh, earlier, there is a, this is a series of natural capital conversations. So the next one exactly in a month from today, it's about climate resilience um, when it comes to water. So please register on the website and then feel free to follow our social media and check our website for uh, recordings of previous conversations and the registration links of upcoming events. And with that, I want to thank both panelists for showing up today, for sharing their wonderful work. Thanks to all attendees for showing up as well and for asking really interesting and difficult questions. And I hope that we leave today by learning a lot on cultural services. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.